All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in um, to tonight's event at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. Tonight we have, uh, and I have the distinct pleasure to be with Helen Drutt, Elizabeth Esner, and Nash Quinn uh, for a program in conjunction to Rings 1968 to 2021. This is a traveling exhibition that after its um, tour at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft will be going on to the Metal Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. So if you don't have a chance to see it in person here in Houston, which will be on view through March 12th, I welcome you to go visit it in Tennessee. Um, before we jump into tonight's program, I did want to just give a brief thanks to uh, Gabrielle Suzinski at the Moore College of Art and Design, who helped us and was very graciously allowed us to utilize some of the furniture for when the show made its original uh, debut there. And I also wanted to give a special thanks to Brooke Garcia and her team at the Metals Museum as well, as this has been a great team effort to be able to tour this wonderful collection that Helen Drutt and Elizabeth Esner have worked to put together for us. So without further ado, I'd like to turn um, the evening over to Helen Drutt and Elizabeth Esner. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, can all of you see that okay? Is that coming through okay? Yeah, that looks great. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I really wanted to begin here um, so all of you can get a glimpse of the Rings exhibition here at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And I do, as Catherine said, really hope all of you get the chance to visit this really beautiful exhibition before it closes on March 12th. You can see it is this kind of floating world of rings. And uh, Catherine, you so elegantly installed this and we just, Helen and I, both want to thank you and the Perry and the team at the, um, at the center um, for all of your work on putting this together and for inviting us here tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. So may uh, I join in also yeah. say thank you. And I thought, I thought that Catherine really did a marvelous job because she, she was left with the entire exhibition. I wasn't there and she was able to use her own innovative eye to find a path and, and reinventing the exhibition, which was a very wonderful learning pro, uh, process for me. So I thank you, Catherine. Thank you, so much. Thank you Helen. I, I really appreciate uh, Elizabeth and Helen for your kind words. It's been such a pleasure and an honor to be able to work with you both. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and, and for me, it was really a privilege to work as a researcher on this project organized by the one and only Helen Drutt. Um, as some of you know, I just recently joined the Museum of Fine Arts Houston as the Wingate Foundation Associate Curator of Craft. And so I have to say, it really does feel something like kismet to be able to be in Houston, albeit virtually, talking to all of you about this exhibition, Rings. And um, I thought I would give you just a little bit of background before Helen and I begin our conversation. And... Um, I should point out that this exhibition is in really good company. And I wanted to specifically point to scholar Beatrice Jador Sampson's really extensive and in fact encyclopedic collection of modern and contemporary rings, part of the Allison Lewis Koch collection. And of course, Rings Redo, this incredibly luxurious catalog that accompanied Susan Grant Lewin's collection of rings that was shown at the SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah, Georgia this past year, uh, really skillfully organized by Ursula Newman. And um, just to give you a little bit of background on Helen, I know she won't say this, so I will. Uh, it is hard to overstate Helen's role in the development of what we now know as contemporary jewelry. And uh, Catherine, as you well know, um, the HCCC and certainly the Museum of Fine Arts Houston have really benefited from Helen's keen eye and a lifetime of support of artists and their work. 
And among Helen's long list of accomplishments, she co-authored the book you're looking at on the left, The Jewelry of Our Time with Peter Dormer. It was published in 1995. And at the MFA Houston, the, of course, the Helen Williams Druck Collection, we are fortunate to hold nearly 800 works by 175 artists from 18 countries, uh, all of which was rigorously and elegantly documented by Cindy Strauss, the Sarah and Bill Morgan Curator of Decorative Art, Craft and Design. And the exhibition, Ornament as Art, opened at the MFA in 2007. It traveled to four US museums and um, I know for me and many in the field, this was really a watershed moment for jewelry. Um, it is all beautifully documented in the catalog you are looking at here on the right, um, which has really since become a key foundational text for the field. So ooh, with all of that in mind, this exhibition rings can be viewed through a lot of different lenses. There are more than 150 rings that Helen has put together from artists spanning four continents. It is made up of work from Helen's collection and those from artists in her orbit. And it's interesting that looking across a singular typology, you can see each artist's really distinct voice, but also some of these larger themes. Rings are small, but they are powerful communicators. You can read so much just by looking at someone's finger. And of course, this is really rich territory for artists. And you can see even just here in this selection, the ways that some kind of revel in the rings form and its meaning and how others really kind of push up against those, those structures to find new ways to express this ancient form. And of course, you can also see this exhibition, Helen, as a lens through which to view your own history in the field through your selection of work. Uh, so tonight, I'm really excited to talk with you, Helen. And I want to begin with really a simple question. What, what was the spark that got you thinking about putting together an exhibition on rings? First of all, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your kind words. But you must all, all remember that I am nothing without the artists. If the artists don't exist, I don't exist, or, nor does anybody else who's interested in the field. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand how did I really uh, become interested in rings. I think, if I think very clearly, I'm interested in forms. And I've always been interested in what a form can do creatively and how it can act as a catalyst for an expansive exploration of ideas. I think the first form that I was really interested in was a cup. And I did a cup show in 1972. And from the cup show, I went to plates because their surfaces allowed an expansive uh, creative you know, a response. And then from the plates, I went to terrines and I did two terrine show, but I was always interested in what one constant form can do to, to expand the, the, the concept of that form. And I think that rings was, was, followed that interest from cups to terrines, to terrines, to rings. So, I, and I was interested in the ring because the ring was a communicator. I remember once sitting in a railroad station at nine o'clock at night, I had missed my train. I was going to go back to my house and suddenly, uh, a char leader, char a woman who was cleaning the floor came over to me and asked me, what was I wearing? And before I knew it, I was giving a lecture for over an hour and a half. So I, I think that the ring, you know, invites, invites correspondence and invites, car and, and it also allows as a form and a kind of explosive sense of creativity. It's mm. not just simple circle around your finger. It becomes a pedestal or a podium for an extraordinary idea. So I think that, and I, I know that you're also asking me, how did the ring show develop? I was sitting in the apartment and I was looking at a ring by, <clears throat> by Monica Chichi on the shelf. And next to that, there was a ring by Sam Hu Duong, and then there was a ring by Keith Lewis. And as I was looking at the different forms, I thought, well, 
here's another exhibition. Let's get. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. And I think it is really true, just what you're saying um, about even within these three, you can see how one's sort of exploring that faceting, um, almost like a diamond, yet she's working, uh, Monica Chechi's working in vintage tin. Um, you see how Keith Lewis is exploring ideas around gender and identity and sexuality. Yep. I mean, the theme in his in his rings are really he's exploring sexuality and in this particular ring you know the enameled uh, central portion of that ring rotates so that you can see two sides of his concept which is really wonderful I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you you yeah, know you're great and I think what you talked about before about how someone came up to you because of the jewelry you're wearing this idea of um, of it being public is actually really important. Um, and wearing the work itself is really important. Um, and you, of course, are famous for wearing much of your work, and some of which you have included in this exhibition, including these two works. And I have to say, seeing these, um, you know, jewelry is often completed by the wearer. And I see these, and I see their artist intentions, but I also see them very synonymously with you. So I thought perhaps you could share a bit about these. Yes, well, it, it is true. I mean, I I wore the Mia Matsukata ring and Max Froehlich constantly, all the time, mainly because they were close to my finger. They didn't get engaged with, with my sweaters and they didn't tear anything. But Mia Matsukata, you know, was very important. She was born in Japan. And she immigrated to the United States. I think her brother-in-law was Edward Rickenbauer, and he was the ambassador to Japan. And the, and and so she immigrated to Boston, Massachusetts, where she uh, opened a wonderful. Um, well, I guess it, I get, I hate to call it a shop, but it was a studio and a shop called Yanye J A N I Y E with an S on Goo over the E. And this, but and she also used very. Uh, she liked to use antique elements and then combine the antique elements into a contemporary, uh, into a contemporary work. And this particular ring was made by using a tasuba, which is a an antique sword guard that you would put over. You know, the, the tip of the sword would go into that slot and it would protect it. And she she used that element to uh, create this ring. The other thing about Mia Matsukata that's important is that she was invited to show in Japan, I think in 1968 or 69. And she then invited Stanley Lexen and Olaf Skukvers from Philadelphia to join her. And it was the first time that American work was seen in Tokyo, Japan. And I think the exhibition was called Three Jewelers. I'm not, I'm not I don't remember correctly, but I think it was called Three Jewelers, and it, it was an amazing exhibition. Max Rolick was from Switzerland. His father was involved in Ghana in, in developing a textile industry. He went to Africa, and there he became involved with the Ashanti casting and, be, and decided to really explore Ashanti casting, brought the concept of Ashanti casting back to Switzerland and became quite famous. So this is a cast for his for that technique in, 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 in Europe. And this is a cast silver ring by Max Froelich. And I wore those two rings constantly. It was hard to give them up to the exhibition. Uh, <laughs> actually, it was hard, but at the same time, it left me with the possibility of exploring other avenues. Well, that is well put. You know, I think you've often you've often said to me, and I think it's really beautiful how when you wear an artist's work, you really restore their history. And um, kind of following along those lines of history, uh, this is one of the earliest pieces in the exhibition by the uh, incomparable Klaus Bori whose influence, of course, in using this new material of acrylic with really a goldsmith skill. And I hope everybody can see right. um, 
how complex this work is. I think his influence was felt, of course, in his home of Europe, but also here, here in the US. So Helen, I was hoping, well, since this is one of the earliest works and it's been in your collection a long time, although I promise well, if, I, yeah. Well, Klaus Gerd Worthman and Fritz Meyerhofer, who became very innovative in using acrylic and plastics in, in with with gold and with silver. Uh, Klaus came to the United States at the invitation of Ida Bolin, who was a major collector in in Amsterdam of contemporary jewelry. Actually, she and Inga Assenbaum were the two really forceful uh, public uh, collectors. And she sent him to the United States because she thought it was important for him to to become pre to understand what was happening in America. Uh, he arrived just at the time that I began my gallery and I had received from the bank my first check, my first loan of $10,000. And now when I look at my checkbook, the first check that I made was for $400 to Klaus Bory. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought to myself, here I am, you know, going to the bank, I want, I, in order to, fund a very practical endeavor and I'm buying a ring and I did buy the ring. And so it was probably among, it wasn't the first thing I bought because I had bought an Olaf scoop was previous to that, but it was the first uh, incident in which I could feel that surge of desire. I had never seen anything like this ring. I had never seen a ring that was created with such an innovative sense of, of design. And I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with the rest of your, um, your loan check, you did actually, of course, open your uh, eponymous uh, name right. gallery I, in 1973. And well, it, it was really a, a center for the field um, through 2002 right. and um, your influence beyond. Um, but during that time, you really uh, have known, have championed generations of artists in Philadelphia. And in this show, you can see a selection of them. And I thought maybe you could walk us through these. Right, it, it's really interesting. You know, I'm looking right now at, at these, what, one, two, three, four, five works. And I'm looking, specifically at the Stanley Lexin, and I look at the Lexin and I say to myself, you've come a long way, baby, because <laughs> here we are, cast gold with, set with a stone, very traditional, a very traditional piece for Stanley. But then I look at the, at what has, you know, uh, been created in the city since then, you know, the, the Stacy Lee Weber and the Mark Wagner uh, ring in which a, photographic image of George Washington becomes Groucho Marx. And then we look at, uh, it's very interesting, I'm looking at Caroline Gore, and who's using site-specific photographic images and then extending it into a ring. And I just remembered this afternoon that the first time I saw her work was at the Lawndale Second ah. Art. That is the first time I saw Caroline's work. She had an exhibition of her of her site specific photographs and medals, and that's sort of an interesting. Well, it's just it's very interesting to me that we come full circle, and above that we have Doug Bucci, who as a diabetic is constantly exploring the biological process in order to be through a kind of digital process in order to create works of art, mm -hmm. and. And then to your left is our torpedo, the greater generation torpedo ring that was made by Ken Jaranowski and, and his father and his uncle. I think they went, they were in the war. They brought back a coin. Soldiers during the Second World War often used coins to create works of art, like rings or badges or whatever. But here you have Philadelphia and it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how the transition has taken place from the 60s and throughout 
contemporary times. Of course, we don't have everybody here. Olaf Skupra and, and Richard Reinhardt were very dominant members of the, of the jewelry and metalsmithing community in Philadelphia. And actually, because of Stanley and because of Olaf, it's one of the reasons that people like Klaus Burry and Friedrich Becker came to the United States because they went to Europe in the 60s and they visited studios all over Europe. And as a result of their visit, Philadelphia became rather famous for metalsmith. Mm -hmm. I love that you talk about this cross dialogue because that's actually um, really evident in, in this exhibition as well. And this is sort of a rare opportunity to see a great selection of, of jewelry from the Czech Republic. When did you, when was your first exposure to Czech jewelry? Well, my first exposure was in the early eighties when Pavel Obrzeszynski came to the United States. And that was before Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic. And they sought asylum in the United States. And many people like Pavel, who were sculptors, began to make jewelry in order to sustain an economic base and to have a living. And, they, and jewelry became the form that allowed them to visit studios, to visit galleries, and to create an economic base for themselves. But I, I must say that I have to really give credit to Julie Bergman, mm -hmm. uh, who at one point, at one time was married to Pavel, but is no longer married to him. But she has really established a, an oasis for Czech jewelry and through jewelry, and through jewelry when, she, when she comes to Munich in particular and she does her exhibitions of Czech jewelry, I am introduced to works that I had never seen before, which is really great. And in particular, Carol Vatopka on, on your left, and mm -hmm. also the late um, Casale. Mm -hmm. so I have to really, really commend her for her innovation. She also introduced me, and I can't read his name, but I do know his name, to Milan Novacek. Novacek, yeah. Novacek who created a structure in wood, uh, almost, like the, uh, almost like the little temples in Japan. It was influenced by that. And then you tie on your wishes and you can write on your wishes. And, and there's an entire, uh, there's an entire uh, exhibition devoted to these pieces. And it depends on, I think this particular one is white, but I think you can use gold to signify something else. But again, I'm saying thank you, Julie Bergman, for, for Czech, the Czech Republic. That's great. And even further afield, um, we have work by Nikki Sawanchuka um, here that's very contemporary, made in 2019, right. actually right, you, right. right before uh, the pandemic, yeah. I was in India during uh, January of 2019, and I was invited, someone, someone communicated my presence in India to Nikki and at the Shwanaski, the Shwanasuka Institute and invited me to give a lecture. And when I was there, she brought works that she had been working on and I was astounded, you know, these were works that were made with rice and lentils and, 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 and a variety of seeds. I had never seen rings that were made like that. She also had a really beautiful pendant and necklace. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to get the two rings, which they actually had gifted to me for presenting my lecture. And they are now in the exhibition. It's amazing how permanent the seeds have remained. We haven't lost, we haven't lost the lentil yet. <laughs> I you know, it's really funny. I, I, I'm going to go off, off a little bit. Just two weeks ago, I saw Sid Carpenter's uh, exhibition of, of ceramics, and she had a sculpture that was literally covered with lentils, in which she had placed every single lentil on the surface. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. You know, I think it is when you showed these to me and I, I was so struck by the enormous amount of care and, and really craft 
uh, that was given to these um, very, very non-traditional materials. Yeah, and they're meticulously made and, and they have sustained their permanent sensibility, which is really wonderful. Mm. And I think there are other ways, right, to look at this exhibition and, and speaking of non-traditional materials, here we have uh, three very different approaches to the found object. And right. Helen, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here uh, to say that we literally had to take this, this Bernard Schobinger, which you see on the left, we literally had to take it off of your finger and put it absolutely on. This right. Absolutely right. It was um, one of the most menu. difficult yeah. things me to to remove that from my hand because I really love wearing that that ring mm -hmm. and Bernard created that ring by diving into Lake Zurich and when he would dive he would you know at the bottom he would see rings on the floor of the lake and he collected the rings and we often wondered were they lost while somebody was swimming or was there an argument on shore and on the shore and somebody threw their wedding band into the lake mm -hmm. but <laughs> whatever and he sent me a wonderful photograph of himself wearing his diving shoe suit wearing a fork in his hand but i do love that ring it's really great and he and used a metal detector right a metal detector underwater is that i how? i yeah. think so right yeah. but he also has a diving fork you know <laughs> and and he, and he goes in full gear you know really you know, he's very passionate about what he's doing. And and he also, you know, has collected fishing hooks and has one has created wonderful necklaces using the fishing hooks. One is called Mermaid's Wedding. <laughs> it's really quite beautiful. You can't actually wear it because it, it you know, it would impregnate your this your skin. And then we have a found object by Thomas Gentili. Uh, and of course, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's making reference to, to the found object by Marcel Duchamp, which, which becomes, you know, a work of art by its very selection by the artist. Mm -hmm. And then next is the Kip Slemons. I really love this. It reminded me of the Bauhaus and it also reminded me of Ox Oscar Schlemmer. Mm -hmm. and, and and I and I know that she you know she, the 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 use of the pencil is a very traditional and constant uh, element and form in her in her work, but it was the total configuration of this piece that really got to me. I just you know I just saw Oscar Schlemmer and I knew that it had to be a, a ring that I wanted to have in my possession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's called finger puppet, and it really is like that. And it, it does have several kinetic uh, uh, parts, both those. And, the and they move. They yes. move. And actually, it's, go ahead. it's okay. jewelry that's wearing jewelry, which I always love. And, and actually, that necklace that it's wearing is, is kinetic as well. Um, this uh, one thing that's interesting is this exhibition has grown at, since it was in Philadelphia, and these are two of many really special additions to the to the right. center's exhibition. So, Helen, maybe you could tell us a little bit about. Yuri Kamada was a gift to me on my 90th birthday by Dirk Algeyer, who was my publisher and who was a director of Arnoldshire Publishing, and he came for my birthday, which was really wonderful. And he bought this beautiful Yuri Kamada ring, and the you know the 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 camera lens is so beautiful. It's sort of really iridescent. It it, it almost has the transfer value of a stone of a of a stone. I mean, one one might even think that it's a stone when you see it from afar because it's incredibly uh, it's luscious, and it and and it has a you know, this wonderful purple translucency and purple's my favorite color. So it was really a great thing. And I'm very pleased to have a Kamada in, in, the, in the collection. I think there are 21 works in the collection that I do not own where I invited artists to become part of the exhibition once I knew that it was going to be exhibited because I thought it would be nice to expand that educational basis. Mm -hmm. 
I called Joyce Scott one day and told her that I wanted her to, you know, to be part of the exhibition. And did she have a ring? And she said, well, come to Baltimore. And I did. Little did I know that the ring was actually made by three artists uh, because Joyce cannot forge silver. She does not work with silver. And so she worked with Lauren Schott and Shana Crows. And Lauren set the stones and Shana uh, created the silver foundation for uh, Joyce's beading. And I think it's really a wonderful piece. You know, it's a, it's a kind of, it's also wonderful to see three different artists using their own, you know, singular techniques come together to create one piece. I agree. And I'm just going to, I'm going to move fairly quickly through the last few, just because I want to make sure we leave time to talk with Nash. But this one is, of course, quite special that will be uh, at the Metals Museum, uh, although it is not in the the show at Houston. Um, it, didn't, it did not make it to look forward it, it to. The, yeah. It did not, but it was in the it was in the original exhibition. It did not make the voyage to Houston because the gelatin, the red gelatin over Peter's face had had disappeared. At any rate, this is my engagement ring. And if you look closely, you can't You're see wearing me. it now. Yeah. Can you, can you see me? No, I don't think so. I don't see me. Do you, you see can it? you can see yeah if you just put it up you're you're actually wearing the ring right now right so, so yeah. if you look closely there's a red gelatin over peter's face and then if you open the other part of the locket there we are together when when we decided to get married uh peter's staff at storm king insisted that he buy a ruby for me and i said i don't wear gems so please do not do that and, but he insisted, so we went, I, I followed his suit and we went to Tiffany's. And as the woman at the counter kept showing him rubies and the digits kept getting higher and higher and higher and higher, he turned to me and he said, you know, you're really right. <laughs> he said, you have artists who can do things that are innovative. And so we contacted Gerd Rothman and Gerd made my ruby, which is here with Peter's portrait with a slice of red gelatin over it. So you so got your ruby after all. I, did, I got my ruby. He got his, yes, he got the ruby after all. We, I got my yeah. ruby after all, which is wonderful. And okay. um, we'll just now, pick through some of these. Yeah, but this is a- the, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, it's a wonderful opportunity to see Manfred Bischoff's work. Um, Petra Zimmerman's work, right. Peter Chang's work. Right. It's it's interesting just to go back for a second to Manfred is that Manfred of, often mounted his jewelry on drawings, which were enriched with language, and the language had references to quotations from art and philosophy and his mentors. And so you see right here, you have a wonderful opportunity to see his work, and this is Trust Fund Baby and. And and if you look at the ring, you'll see the ring looks like a bird because it was sort of a a symbol that he often used for for for, for women or for or for girls. So now we can go on. I'm sorry. No, please. Yeah, and Petra Zimmerman again, two two artists um, whose careers uh, you have been interested in. Obviously, Peter King. So I'm I'm very interested in Petra's. Can, love of fashion as well as art jewelry. I'm very interested in the fact that she uses a resins and she encrusts them with various pearls or, or found objects. And if you look at the one on your upper left, you'll see that it's a, a bag that she has, a small evening beaded bag that she has then, you know, encrust, in, encased in polyester resin and, and created a ring. And then of course there's Peter Chang you know, Peter, we might, well, Peter grew up in Liverpool with the Beatles, you know, and what is the Beatles song? I, I wrote it down here. All of our songs come from the imagination. There was never an Eleanor Rigby. So like the Beatles, you know, Chang's work also comes from the imagination. He's like Brett Town's manifestation 
of defending the rights to the man to to use the man in it to use one's imagination and that's how he created his work his mm. iman- imagination was explosive but he also was uh, very much interested in using epoxy and polyester resins he often often used the tops of erasers that he embedded into the work and these are three unique rings mostly we are familiar with his bracelets mm-hmm. and his brooches, but not with his rings. So this is a wonderful opportunity to see his work. Absolutely. Um, and this is, a, this is a work by Iris Eichenberg, of course, that his, uh, she made specifically for this exhibition. And I think it's a really beautiful testament to how uh, jewelry and especially rings can carry familial memory with them. Um, it is actually, two rings together that were her great, great grandmother and great, great grandfather's wedding rings. And if you look closely, you can actually see the 1886 inscription. And actually her great, great grandmother had worn it so long when she, when she passed away, it actually had to be cut off. And so uh, the artist repaired that cut with the golden tooth of her mother actually as this sort of crowning jewel. Isn't it wonderful that she trusts us to have this and, and, and is also allowing it to travel? I think it's, it's also showing that she has faith in what we're doing, which is really great. Yeah. And here we are, Marjorie Schick, all right? It's not a chess board. It's a kind of frozen board of Russian roulette. And if you look very closely, each totem is hand carved and hand painted And each totem has at the very top of the totem is a ring, a ring which is inserted into a slot at the top of the of of the uh, of the of the uh, of the totem. And and it's really an amazing uh, it's an amazing set of rings. It's an amazing and you see to your left here somebody wearing the ring. So you can take the rings off, you put them in the totem, and then you display them on this palette. Yeah, this really interesting bridge between sort of jewelry and sculpture. Right, and and she's also known really for her large paper mache uh, neck pieces. She's been known for those and her bracelets and also her total, you know, uh, she totally dresses the human body and, and creates, you know, large, uh, large paper mache and wood, not dresses, but the sort of cloaks that are, are that can be worn over a leotard or a dress. Yeah. So we're very lucky to be able to have that. And, 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 and I encourage you to come and examine it very closely. Yeah, no, uh, she foresees so much. Um, and then we have two two works that are really engaged in in movement. Um, one with right. by Falco Marx and Christian Christian Johnson. Johnson. Right. Um, well, the ring by Falco Marx is in, encased in the bezel is a 17th century porcelain portrait, and then there's water over over, but between the water and the porcelain, there are slivers of gold and little diamond chips and gems which move within that pool of water. And, you know, I was thinking about that just this afternoon and I realized that it really reminded me of a Joseph Boy's cast rabbit in a box that is in the Stuttgart Museum of Art, which has a cast rabbit not a not a porcelain Madonna, but also fragments of gold and silver, like nuggets, around it. And I wonder now whether Falco Marx saw that piece and was inspired by that piece. That's interesting. I, I have to look at the date, and it, Falco is dead, so I can't ask him. But at the same time, I I was thinking perhaps he went to Stuttgart and he saw that piece and that it inspired him. Well, yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, uh, well, we know we know at least what Christopher Johnson um, was inspired by the sort of right that enduring idea of vanitas. Um, 
then just to explain how the piece works, that little heart-shaped lever, you open it up and what is that mask opens up and uh, there's the skull that's revealed with a sort of golden tongue that. Right. And the first time I saw his work was I think in the, I think in the eighties or night when I went to Gothenburg and I think I, I, at that time, I, I acquired a brooch of his that looked like an armoire. And when you opened the doors of the armoire, there was a guillotine. <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and um, get to Nash and, and invite Nash you to join us here for your work, which is in rings, uh, sixfold. Hey. Another link to Philadelphia, I might add, because I saw this ring in Philadelphia uh, at an exhibition of entitled Philadelphia Then and Now. And Nash's work was in that exhibition. And I freaked out when I realized that you could open it up and it would spread its wings like an umbrella. So here we are. Come on, Nash. Hello, thank you guys very much. Um, do you want to, do you want to just dive into my part or do you want to say anything yeah. else about this thing or? We want you to dive into your part. <laughs> okay. yeah, I think I'm going to stop the chair if it's okay. okay. And maybe we can, we can start to look. It's been fun to see some pictures, uh, still, but I will be very excited to see your work in action. Right. Awesome. I, I would like to know how you became interested in, in this kind of mechanics and the mechanism what 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 moved you from a static situation into something that could explode um well that is a long story um and i guess before before i dive into that um i just want to say thank you guys for the presentation that you just put on the um the the scholarship and personal connection to that that the work in that show was really um humbling. So uh, it's very much an honor to be included in it. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to thanks to you guys for, for telling us about it. And also a big thanks to HCCC for letting me be a resident here and having these two things intersect has been, uh, has been really exciting. Um, the, <laughs> for, for a show that has like over 100 rings in it, uh, there is nothing boring in it. And every single one of those rings has its own sort of like very unique intrigue. Um, so the, the curation on that show is top notch. Um, but yeah, that, uh, that ring that we just looked at, uh, six fold, it does fold up. Um, it, when, you, when, it's, when you're not wearing it, it sort of folds itself up into a relatively compact form. And then when you put it on, it, it does open up like that. And, and the fact that you mentioned that it's like an umbrella um, is because that's how I, that's like what I did is reverse engineer the function of an umbrella, which is simpler than it looks. Um, and I don't know, uh, I couldn't tell you where, um, where my sort of uh, love for all things small and mechanical comes from. I think it's because they're like toys and, and I never really grew up that much. Um, I still love things that have that sort of trinket value. Um, and, and the act of making that stuff yourself is really challenging. Um, and, and I like the challenge, you know, I like, I like figuring out the hard stuff, which is like spring-based mechanisms and things that have that sort of function. So yeah, my, uh, my, immaturity and my desire to try and, you know, be a better metalsmith, I think sort of converged on, on that aesthetic. Would you be willing to show us perhaps some of the, the rings as how they work? I would love to be able to see yeah. um, some of these feather rings. Yeah. Yeah. So these things um, were created at roughly the same time as that six fold ring that's in the show. Um, and they are based on kind of the same function. These things were created for a show called Forging a Link, which was, um, which was put together by Kathy Kennard, who was my professor in school and is also in the ring show. We saw one of her pieces earlier. Um, and these things are based off of, uh, they're meant to sort of emulate the function of a firearm, but be very playful and safe. Um, and they're spring loaded uh, and the way they work in this case is you have this little sort of button on it that you can push. And when you do so, it pops open like that. And then you can sort of stow it 
again that way. And I made three of them just because um, there's, I don't know, there's just so many ways to sort of engineer that type of object. And these things are more interesting as a group. Um, this one pops open like that. It's kind of my favorite one. It's getting a little ragged these days. I took it to a university and like let the students play with it. And it, um, the feathers are getting all weird. But, um, and then the final one is this guy right here, which again, you know, with the function of that sort of opening up like that and then closing. I really love anything that um, changes its shape uh, or sort of transforms, whether it is something as humble as an umbrella or something like the James Webb telescope, anything that has that sense of like unfolding and revealing is really intriguing to me. Um, and these rings and that ring and that show are, are really sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're just me sort of delving into that idea of a thing that, that can unfold. So yeah, these, these rings were created around the same time as that, uh, as that show, or as that, that ring from the show. Um, if maybe you could show us, and I will, I do just want to say for anyone who's really interested in Nash's work, um, you do have incredible videos on your website of both these rings and also some of your process for some of your other work. So maybe you could walk us walk us through some of that um, that you've been working on at the center during your residency. Yeah, that's a that's that sounds great. I um, I was trying to think about like that. I make a lot of different things. I uh, am a victim of my own folly. Like if I'm interested in a thing, I'm going to be like, oh, let me drop everything and pursue that, um, which I mean, it's not the best way to do it, but it's sort of built into who I am. Um, but I, I think that I, I realized that there is a bit of a through line between things like these rings that sort of like pop open and unfold and transform and the things that I have been really sort of pursuing seriously since the pandemic, which are these pattern form vessels, right? These are these enamel vessels that are, um, they're all created out of one sheet of metal that is, lo and behold, folded up. So I guess fundamentally, the way that one of these vessels, the way this thing comes into being is not all that different from the way that six fold ring works in that it folds up, right? It starts out as a piece of copper like this, a piece of flat sheet metal that can then be folded up like this and turned from flat into a volumetric object. Um, and that, you know, that transformation from flat to sheet is, is endlessly fascinating to me. Um, the way that these things are made, the way that, that these enamel vessels come to be is not practical. It's not a codified way of working with metal. I mean, it is, I call it pattern forming and pattern forming is definitely a thing. But the way that I do it with these like little tabs and slots is ludicrously um, time consuming. And, and uh, I'm the only one who's ever gonna do it this way, I think, because it's so impractical. But I love the way it looks. And I love the connection that you get with that sort of tab and slot construction. This is a steel one that you might be able to see a little better on. And what's going on here is that each one of these little tabs goes through a little slot and the independent panels of an object like this fold up and hold themselves together in that manner, which I really love that as a connection. You know, as, as metalsmiths, we're very want to hide any evidence of process, you know, like file that solder seam until it's perfectly invisible or make that, you know, total flush rivet that you never know is there. But in the case of these things, they're sort of very honest. They're right there in front of you. And you don't have to know anything about metalsmithing technique to understand how an object like this is, is holding itself together, at least for that connection. Um, so that's sort of, uh, that's sort of, you know, what I'm sort of pursuing in, in making these pattern form vessels. They're really beautiful. Thank you. They're, they're very fun to make. Yeah. Um, sometimes they, they take different forms like this one was an early, you know, attempt to combine multiple enamel forms after they come out of the kiln. My kiln is really small um, and something like this wouldn't fit in it. So I was working on figuring out ways to connect things after the fact and then also working in different materials and really just sort of exploring this format um, as much as I can. Are you sort of 
sewing the facets together. It, it yes. It, right. Very much so. It is, you know, it is as much a, a textile technique um, right. as it's a metal smithing technique. And it's even, you know, it's even sort of akin to like the way the clothing is held onto an old fashioned paper doll where it's got those little tabs that fold around. Um, and I really love that. Right. And the rims are, are not enameled, right? The rim. Uh, yeah, in the, so in the case of, of this, yeah, well, that's, that's the base, but the there. rim, the rim when they drown one is not oh, enameled, right? This guy? Right. Yeah, this thing isn't enameled at all. This is all right. just steel. So that's right. just okay. it's just black and steel, and the rim is is soldered on there, and right. it's just glass. And I'd love to hear, you know, being um, being a resident at the center, um, what that's like, how it is interacting perhaps with other residents that are there. Has that sparked anything? We've been in such a moment of sort of isolation. I wonder how that's been to sort of open that world back up to other to other um, artists. Yeah, that I mean, that is what a residency like this is best for is, is putting you in touch with like minded individuals and letting unexpected things occur. I came to this residency with the intent of making nothing but enamel vessels like this. Um, and I decided that like, wait a minute, I need to slow down and get a little bit better at enameling. I made some smaller scale um, enameled work that is kind of the same. So if we look at this little floral brooch right here, the flowers on that thing are basically the exact same thing as this big enamel vessel. Um, right. So still working with that sort of folding things up, but scaling it down a little bit, making it into jewelry um, and working on being a better enamelist. And, and me making these things led to like these sort of enamel flowers, like you see here, led to a collaboration with uh, my friend Joan Brown, who is a ceramicist who shares the studio right next to me. We came to HCCC at the same time. We have the same duration uh, of residency. And we share a lot of values in terms of our work. We are both very fussy and we might like to make things uh, really, really precise. And so what, I, what I'll show is our latest in progress collaborative piece, which I'll start by showing this, which Joan made. This is a porcelain pillow. Um, she is incredibly fastidious with rendering. Um, so she made this porcelain pillow, which I just like, I want to take a bite out of it. You know, it is just the most seductive thing. Right. It um, has a transferred value of fabric. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you can mistake it for fabric. Right. Um, and we wanted to combine Joan's work like this with some of my sort of like smaller scale floral work like this. And, and what I wound up with was creating this thing right here, which is just a shitload of little flowers on a big silver armature. Um, and this thing is gonna turn out incredible. It was a ton of soldering and fabrication um, and a ton of enameling little things, working with multiples, which I don't normally do. And this thing literally just plugs into this porcelain pillow and it's gonna look Wait. like that. Um, and I think that like this thing is gonna have all sorts of wow factor. It definitely, you know, it inhabits uh, some kind of dream world. Um, and we've made another one that was really successful. And this one is really sort of taking that to a, to a new level. Um, and I would have never expected to do anything like this had I not come to this residency and, and decided to collaborate, so. Right, that's wonderful. It really is. Yeah, it's really interesting to see. You can see in each of your works sort of how your mind actually works, this sort of mechanical thinking and how that leads to creativity. And I love in this collaboration how you really can see, um, you can see both artists' vision very, very clearly, yet really brought together. Right. Uh, it takes us into unknown territories, really, which is really wonderful. Indeed. Yeah, for, for sure. And, you know, unknown territories is always exciting. Right. Indeed. How long Thank is, you. oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I just was curious how long you're, how long are you going to continue? How long are you in residence there? Um, my residency here uh, runs through May. Okay, great. 
So I'm hoping to uh, make some more stuff um, in that time, of course, with Joan, and then you know, see what kind of a springboard that serves as um, into the future. I would love to, you know, my goal is to sort of combine like some of the wow factor uh, of this thing with some moving parts. I don't know if that's like too much going on at once, but there's only one way for me to find out, which is to try it. So that is what I'm thinking of for the future right now. Do you, do you think you'll remain in Houston? I think I will. Yeah, Houston is uh, unexpectedly delightful. It's it's a really fun town. There's a lot going on, a lot of support uh, for, for someone like me doing what I do. Um, and yeah, I, uh, unless something drags me out of Houston, um, I will be here for, for a while. And I think that's what's so important about residencies like this is there is this kind of multiplier effect where you come and then you stay and it creates a creative community um, that remains. So it's really exciting. Good, we can right. fellow Houstonians. So I wanted to just jump right in. Thank you all so much. This has been such a lively and engaging conversation. I feel like I could sit and, and listen to you all for so much longer. I have learned so much this evening. I wanted to, uh, give our audience the opportunity to be able to ask each of you a few questions. And in fact, um, we have received a couple of questions in our Facebook chat. So if you would like to speak with Nash or Elizabeth or Helen, um, feel free to put your question into the Facebook chat. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in with the first question. Um, this question is uh, from, uh, Carrie Ann Quick, who's also one of our wonderful residents here, um, and also an incredible metalsmith. This is for Helen. She says, I love your story about the woman in the train station. I'm interested in the idea that a ring invites conversation. Do you think the ring form does that over other jewelry forms? And if so, why? Uh, I, I don't. I, I'm not going to say that the ring form does it more than other jewelry forms, but it's more visible if you're sitting down and you don't have your gloves on and you, you're wearing a coat. Uh, so, but it also invites uh, uh, someone to remove it from your finger. I once had my Wendy Ramshaw removed from my finger in Penn Station while I was sleeping in New York. So, but I do. I, I, I think a brooch also invites a great deal of uh, communication, you know, because it's so visible and it's, it's, it, and it's perched on your body in a very specific place. Um, I think jewelry, all forms of jewelry invite communication and, and all forms of jewelry invite inquiry. I think that's one of the wonderful things about it. You can't walk into an office carrying a pot. You can't carry a chair. You know, you can't carry other forms of, of our field, but you wear jewelry and you are at one time, you know, a source of communication. I was sitting in a restaurant about six months ago or maybe eight months ago. And I had, a, I, I don't remember, I do remember which brooch, but I'm not going to tell you. But a young man sitting two tables from me, who couldn't have been 30 years old, came over to me and said, I want to tell you, I love what you're wearing. I'd like you to tell my girlfriend about this. I mean, it was such a great thing, you know, just totally unexpected. So not just the ring, but I think all forms of jewelry really invite a kind of you know, uh, unexpected communication. You know, I remember once wearing a Stanley Lexan torque, you know, the big polyester torques. It's now in, it is now in the permanent collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, and I, I was on a plane going, I, I think I was going to Cranbrook. I was on a plane going to Cranbrook. This was in the late seventies when I wore my Lexan Turks all the time. I was sitting in the economy in the plane. The stewardess came over and she said, do you mind coming to first class and telling us about your jewelry? I said, of course. 
Does that that's answer your question? Pardon? Yeah. No, that's I, that's fantastic. I think yes, that's a wonderful answer to Carrie Ann's question, and it just goes to show, you know, what conversations jewelry can spark, and also really helping kind of forge connections between ourselves and those around us. So that's that's wonderful. Um, this is not a question, but a comment from Sandy Zilker. She says, "Hi, Helen. It's great to see you, even on a screen. Thanks for putting." Uh, together the show and having it come to Houston. So I wanted to pass that along. I look forward uh, to seeing her, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and for those who don't know Sandy, she uh, is uh, an incredible metalsmith in her own right and teaches over at the Cassell School of Art at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Um, we have another question um, from Judy. Um, Judy asks, which rings from the exhibition have particularly inspired Nash? Um, so the, this is for you, Nash. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, um, the one that we looked at um, by that uh, guy from Sweden um, with, the, with the mechanical parts is like, I'm of course going to be drooling over that thing. Um, but I think like the, the type of rings that I enjoy the most are what I would call rings in name only where like they're kind of a sculpture with a, with a hole in it. Um, so that, that piece that we looked at um, uh, by uh, Milan, Milan Novacek, um, that thing that is the bamboo and the paper, um, that thing is for one, beautifully constructed um, and for two, like the suggestion that it is a ring is accomplished by the two like smallest little sort of semicircular cuts in it that suggest that something round could go through there. Um, and I really sort of love that. Um, and I also, you know, one of the rings that I'll always remember is that little found cartridge bearing that where it was just like completely appropriated. Um, I think that that's really interesting as well. So those are a few individual examples, but you know, the show as a whole, like I was saying, there's there's not a single duplicate idea in that entire show, even though every one of them is a ring. Um, and and that's uh, like that's what I think is is sort of the most profound about it. Very exciting to hear. Beautifully put. Great. Thank you. For, Do you for, have an, another? Sorry, Helen. I think I cut you off. Could you repeat oh, that? Right. I was just saying. That's a great compliment to all the artists, you know, really. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have one additional question. This is also for Nash. Um, I think in your, your talk, as you were showing um, your first uh, series um, that incorporates the bullet casings or, or pieces of metal that look like um, that, um, Maria Lisa wants to know, um, more about the spring loading trigger mechanism and the contrast your rings present with other trigger loaded items, namely guns. Um, well, Maria Lisa, come take my class about spring based mechanisms. No, um, <laughs> that, uh, that um, trigger, like every single like mechanism that is like a trigger, everything that like clicks into position and holds energy, um, those are all fundamentally the same. So the way the trigger mechanisms on those rings work is, you know, it's based on the exact same principles as the trigger of a firearm, which happens to be the exact same pr principle as like the ramp surfaces on your door that make it click shut. <laughs> um, it's all it's all exactly the same. Um, and like studying that type of stuff is like that's what I wanted to do with these. Um, these red rings is sort of like revel in the sort of technical mastery of firearms um, without having to uh, participate in the like horror that are firearms. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I think so. Thank you, Catherine, for hosting. It's really been wonderful. And I want to thank you, Elizabeth, for all your hard work. I remember, what is it, three or four years ago, when you sat in my library measuring the rings so precisely. So we've come a long way. <laughs> and it's been a wonderful journey. And uh, 
and I'm so pleased that it's here in Houston. I um, couldn't think. I'm Thank just you, doubling. Though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, we do, I, I know we, we probably do want to wrap things up relatively soon because we're over time. There's um, one, one last question that we have from our audience. And before I ask that, I also wanted to mention, Helen, um, your daughter wrote saying that she keeps learning more every time and uh, she loves getting to hear you speak about your work. So <laughs> I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Um, and we, we have an, another question question um to you helen um judy asks do you attribute jewelry and creativity with keeping you so young <laughs> i i uh you mean because i'm 91 okay i contribute work i think work is a great catalyst for maintaining one's you know energy I think also because I wear hats, I don't let the sun get on my face, <laughs> which is really true. I, do. I don't know what keeps me young. I just think I don't, I don't feel young, but I, I know that at 91, I have a lot of energy and I've been given the great privilege of continuing to work and to have ideas and to more than, and to be able to, to, be able to support my field, which is the core of my life. You know, I am totally involved with with the crafts, all media, not just metals. I, you know, I spend hours in furniture studios as well as ceramic studios and textile. So I, I think the fact that I'm working and that I'm not playing bridge and having lunch. <laughs> is is it is very supportive of maintaining uh, one's physical and mental uh, ability to to communicate i don't know what else to say <laughs> I, don't I don't think there is anything else to say i mean helen i think that your work ethic and the world that you have opened up for so many people it's um, absolutely incredible and uh, something that I think we should all aspire to. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for um, all that you've contributed to our field. But I also wanted to just, again, say a big thank you, Helen and Elizabeth, for your working relationship together and putting this show together. I think. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity for us. We're so, so thrilled to be able to have it in Houston. And I'm glad it worked out that Nash, uh, that your residency coincided with the run of this exhibition to be able to uh, spend the evening with the three of you has been a real pleasure. And uh, I just wanna thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna thank the artists also for supporting the exhibition for allowing a dialogue to be extensive. I know that Elizabeth quizzed them from A to Z at all times <laughs> in order to get, you know, and, and I know that. And I, I wanna thank the artists for making this possible because without them, there is no us at all. Perfectly put, yeah. Well, I think on that note, we will close the evening. Thank you all so much. And uh, I encourage those who are in Houston to come to the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. The show will be on view through March 12th. And if you miss it here, um, it's a great excuse to travel to Memphis at the Metal Museum. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kevin. Much appreciated.